quickly get going uh, because you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to our speakers and invite Kirk Hull from KPMG to begin our presentation. Morning all, uh, hopefully you can all see me and hear me now. Um, by, by ways of quick introduction, uh, my name is Kirk Hull. I am a director in KPMG's operation advisory team focused on, on supply chain transformation. I've been with KPMG for 12 years uh, and in that time I've worked across multiple sectors including <coughs> automotive, aerospace, CPG, pharma and oil and gas. Prior to KPMG, I had 11 years uh, industry experience, predominantly in automotive and telcos with uh, BMW, Nortel and Motorola. I'm happy to be here this morning to share some of our thinking around financial and operation resilience and, and uh, share of some of the things that we're seeing in the market. I wanted to start this morning, um, if we can move to the next slide, just by sharing our uh, enterprise resilience framework. You know, so this might help. Uh, might help you think about kind of enterprise-wide resilience uh, and, and some of the things that, that you might need to consider. There, there's three main um, vertical pillars there you can see. Two of them we're going to touch on this morning with myself and Chris. So financial resilience, operational resilience, and, and commercial resilience. Um, I'll send out the, or we'll send out the link to the full uh, framework after the call so you'll be able to look at some of the other areas that are in this that, that we might not cover this morning. Second uh, thing I wanted to just share on the next slide is, is around when we when we think about resilience, we think about you know the the stages in in responding to to any major crisis, and we think about those in, in terms of four R's. So initial stage of reaction, you know, so that initial crisis management, uh, understanding what the risks and the impacts are in the business, and moving from there into resilience. You know, developing what are the what are the scenarios of uh, what the future might look like and what are the responses to those through into recovery you know so resetting what uh, what the business is going to look like and, and also identifying new opportunities at the same time uh, and then into the the new reality and adapting to what the new world is so as we go through uh, and talk about operational and, and financial resilience and the framework we will be looking at it in the context of those stages and what are some of the activities to look at in, in each of those. Uh, next slide. So if I, if I jump into um, supply chain resilience then uh, and think about you know things that you may already have already um, put in place prior to uh, the furlough closure, you know, but what are some of the things to think about in, in, in the short term in terms of uh, supply chain resilience? You know, so first and foremost is, is really setting up that, that COVID command center or that crisis unit, ideally as a separate team away from business as usual, so that they can help focus in on the response to the crisis itself, you know, really uh, bubble up what are the key issues that are happening and, and drive decisions to be made. Second thing, you know, um, uh, well, and I'm sure that a lot of you will have done this as part of preparations for Brexit before um, before COVID hit, is really understand what your supply chain is. You know, map that supply chain to to get a much greater level of detail than, than probably you've ever had before. You know, getting below your tier one suppliers and understanding where their suppliers are in tier two and even down into tier three. Understanding you know, your logistics flows. You know, where where are the products coming from, what ports are they going through, what are your service providers from a logistics point of view, so that as, uh, you know, as things happen and as different um, uh, things roll out from across the, the globe, then you can very quickly understand what that impact is on your supply chain and your business. You know, so some of the other things that, uh, that you may have also carried out before, uh, before closure, you know, carrying out that key risk assessment, and been able to see the wood for the trees. So identifying what are the key components and the key raw materials that are going into the, the products and uh, to the customers that have the biggest impact on, on your revenue and margin. So it'll help you really be able to focus in on what, what are the, the key issues or the key products and the key customers that you need to ideally keep servicing to have a minimum impact on your, uh, your revenue and your margin. And then from that, you know, here are your critical suppliers just to help you focus in on you know, what's critical and what's not. But you know, coming back out of, uh, of furlough and restarting operations, uh, it is very much the, the case that you might need to you know, review and refresh and update some of these. You know, so getting back into communications with 
you know, those critical suppliers, understanding what's happening with them, what's happening from an open purchase order point of view, when, when is that material going to start flowing back in again, you know, and how are those suppliers uh, managing themselves in terms of their, their crisis response. Uh, and also not, not just looking at it from a supply point of view, but also what's happening to your own open order book uh, and what's happening from, from a customer perspective and, and what changes might that have on, on the overall demand for the business. And finally, at the bottom of the slide there, you know, in terms of short term, uh, critical to set up that clear governance structure so that as things uh, happen uh, and decisions need to be made in terms of allocations, then um, you know, that, that can happen quickly. So that's kind of short term reactionary phase. If we jump down to the next slide and look at, at medium term, um, you know, this is really about getting, getting that, that team that's been set up to manage the, the, the crisis, that COVID command center out of crisis mode and into uh, you know, planning and monitoring. You know, so how, how, uh, how you're currently performing and uh, bubbling up where the issues are to drive uh, significant decisions, but also starting to think about you know, what are the scenarios? What's the future look like? Building those future scenario models, what might happen to supply, what could happen to demand in terms of predictions, uh, and then what are the subsequent responses uh, that you would uh, uh, that you would roll out as, as a result of those? What are the impacts on the customers? And then you know, bringing in uh, what that would actually mean from a financial business performance, cash flow, working capital, and an inventory point of view. So that you can, you know, as, as things progress, as you get to understand more, you've already worked through what those various scenarios are. Clearly, it's, it's critical to continue the conversations with your suppliers, and you might need to start thinking about, you know, uh, ways to help mitigate the risk, maybe um, changing some of those contractual conditions around how much inventory or buffer uh, they're holding and uh, on, on which locations. Uh, and then if you, if you haven't already got a robust integrated planning process, you know, it's going to be key moving forward as, as the level of volatility remains high to implement that process so that you can uh, have a, a, a cross-business discussion between you know, commercial, functional and supply chain um, parts of the business to understand the, the, some of the trade-offs between demand and supply. And then you got made, as part of that process may look to uh, you know start to include and collaborate with the with the key suppliers, bringing them into that, so that you've got what's going on within the supply chain, and that will indeed help um, make those make those decisions. We seem to have jumped down a few too many slides there. So moving into uh, some long term. Um, just on to the next slide, some long-term uh, actions uh, that you might, you know, I'm going to start thinking about. Um, you know, the next 12 to 24 months is, is uncertain at best. You know, there's lots of commentary out there about, uh, you know, it could take 12, 18, or even 24 months for for a vaccine to be rolled out. You know, and and that, you know, the the with that comes the potential for potent, you know, second and third waves of the virus. So it's likely that there's going to be um, you know, varying levels of lockdown and social distancing required across the globe. Um, so that level of uncertainty uh, is going to continue within the supply chain. And with that, there needs to be a level of flexibility. So one of the things that we think is going to be really critical to, to navigating that path to the recovery is, is really around better information and real-time information from suppliers to understand what's happening in the supply chain uh, and also with that, an improved ability within an organization to be able to model that additional data and, and be able to predict and, and come up with the right actions as a result of um, you know, that better understanding of what's going on. You know, one of the other things that uh, organizations will, will need to start thinking about to, to move through recovery into the new reality is, you know, what, what is that new reality going to look like? So some of the things that uh, that need to be considered, um, you know, what what's the review of the existing operations? So how how have you managed through the crisis thus far? You know, where have the main pain points be? Where are the lessons learned, uh, and what are the key constraints that that ideally need to be um, removed? Um, the second thing to really consider as part of what that new reality is going to look like is you know, what are the changes in in customer behaviors? You know, as 
as consumers all ourselves, you know, our, our own customer behaviors have changed significantly over the last five or six weeks with a, with a significant move to the online, you know, how much of that is going to be uh, reflected in, in business as well. So what are those changes in customer behaviors and are they permanent? You know, so are there changes in volumes? What are the, the impacts on product portfolio? What about the change in, in channel mix or you know, move from direct to indirect or online channels? You know, are there impacts in markets and sectors that you're currently servicing or, or in geographies? You know, and as, you know, as, such, as such, defining what that could look like for the future. It's also worth noting that you know, not all of this could be downside. You know, there are, you know, with every, with every crisis, there is opportunity. You know, and the Chinese word for crisis means both danger and opportunity. So it could be upsides, you know, and it's identifying those. And if we look at some of those high, you know, high profile ones that we've heard in, in, the, in the media, you know, the likes of Dyson making ventilators or Jaguar Land Rover uh, making, you know, PPE plastic visors for the NHS. And even Louis Vuitton getting on in on the action with N95 face masks, you know. So there could be new opportunities. What are those new opportunities? Be they new products, new customers, or new markets that you would want to break into? What that, uh, what that new reality looks like. And then with all of that, there's there's also the the need to reassess the the organisation's appetite for supply chain risk, you know. So that we've had a, a number of you know huge unprecedented disruptions over the last number of years, you know, first Brexit and now, now COVID, you know, how does that change your organization's appetite to risk? What does that mean in terms of your future sourcing strategies? So you know, trade-offs between low cost country sourcing and you know, uh, sourcing things closer to home. What about make versus buy decisions for the future? You know, are you, would you look to bring things more in house, near shore, near shore versus far shore? And single and multi-sourcing strategy. So, you know, a, a review and a, and a reconsideration of uh, an organization's supply chain risk appetite. And with all of that together, then, you know, uh, I'll look to what that means from um, uh, a physical supply chain point of view. You know, I need potentially to right size the operations for the future, optimize the existing footprint, uh, and then whilst doing that, almost obviously taking a look to the future in terms of future proofing and baking in uh, any ethical supply chain or ESG considerations. So that that's a, a quick talk through kind of some uh, short, medium, and long-term actions from a supply chain resilience point of view. I'll now hand over to Chris uh, to give you some thoughts around financial resilience. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Kirk, and thanks everyone for joining. So I, I'm a director in the, the corporate finance team at KPMG Ireland. So the significant disruption is obviously creating liquidity pressure right across the manufacturing sector. In NA, we have global and national market leaders uh, across the manufacturing sector that we're trading very strongly and we're robust health that in a very short space of time are now at the risk of running out of cash or at least significantly eaten into to, to cash reserves. So I'm going to touch on so just some of the, the, the practical areas that companies should be considered in terms of liquidity and financing, some immediate actions, but also some considerations as they start to open up and move across the different stages. Listen, hopefully that isn't too far away, um, but it does look like it's going to be a, a, a gradual process, and that's certainly all the, the, the noises, and Kirk has touched on that. So in terms of immediate actions, conscious, you know, hopefully most of these have been implemented at this stage, but the, the importance of cash and cash preservation can't be overstressed in, in the current environment. In this context, drawing down all existing funding lines to maximize available cash is something that we're seeing and, and would certainly recommend. Setting up robust cash flow forecasts and, and reviewing these um, regularly, uh, identifying ways to, to reduce costs and, and, and preserve cash. I suppose at the easier end of that scale, you have you know maximizing existing supplier payment terms uh, on the, the less easier scale, deferring capex, uh, initially growth projects, you know, but also maintenance uh, if that's possible, and then the more difficult, um, which is re reducing operations, which for manufacturing you know, brings its its own, um, I suppose, difficult um, issues. Um, also then, uh, well, people should be fully availing of the variance government's supports. So the, the GRS schemes, business rates relief grants, 
various tax support and, and, and sick pay cover. You know, they're, they're there for a purpose. So, you know, educate companies educating themselves and, and fully availing of them is you know, key. Then looking to refresh, refresh forecasts, incorporating all, all these factors so that you can evaluate the, the funding considerations. So what is that if you have closed factories or, or, or part of factory, you know, what is the cash going, going to be over, over the coming months? Um, and what is the, the, the funding requirement for that? And then you're engaged with lenders early, both on, on loan schemes supported by the government, but also in connection with, with wider lending support with, you know, well considered forecasts and John will come on to, to some, some detail on this in, in a few minutes. In terms of the medium term actions, so you know, really embedding that cash focus culture across the business. One of, one of the key areas that companies are now going to be looking at is forecasting the effect of reawakening parts or, or all of their business that have effectively been hibernating. So what are the different scenarios that should be considered? What, what does the business look like with the factory operating it? At fifty percent, at sixty percent, or or whatever that appropriate period of appropriate capacity and appropriate period of time might be, and really plan out them different scenarios, but also then factoring in, you know, the, the important safety and social distancing measures and, and the impact that that they might have on efficiency and, and costs, etc. So th this will also require continued engagement with lenders or alternative funding providers to maximise total available headroom. You know, if this is required, we're certainly seeing plenty of examples of, of companies, you know, even if they have, you know, they're well capitalized and have cash reserves, putting additional facilities in, in place to provide liquidity uh, as they're starting to look around the crisis to an extent, or certainly starting to look a bit, a bit further out than they were, you know, even a matter of weeks ago. And uh, as Kirk has suggested, Working with suppliers to to understand their funding presence and, and how they may impact your operations is also going to be key. Looking to the, to the longer term actions, then assessing the potential impact of the crisis on on longer term behaviour by customers and suppliers difficult to do, but um, is going to be important. Considering ways to optimise the funding arrangements for, for a less certain future. You know, as Craig has alluded to, the, the risk of further disruption or at least prolonged measures is likely to linger, unfortunately. In addition to this, companies will have a new capital structure. So even if you've been fortunate not to need to take on any new debt, it is likely that you'll have been eaten into cash reserves. So you know, your, your balance sheet is going to look, look different. Um, so it may be appropriate to consider if there are other funding options that might supplement the, the, the current facilities. So this might be working capital facilities, um, asset finance facilities, alternative debt support, to, you know, the current um, primary lender, mezzanine options, equity options, et cetera. Because the, the nature of the recovery may require different funding sources than were utilized by companies historically. And the overall, overall goal here will be put in place, to put in place a long-term financing structure to support a return to I don't know if you can call it normalized, but certainly some sort of normal trading conditions in the new reality, which will include investment and growth. So I'm now going to pass over to, to John, who is going to talk about um, banking support. Morning, folks. Uh, and first off, thanks to Stephen, Mary, Connor and the team at Manufacturing NI for inviting me to speak on the call. By way of introduction, I'm uh, John Mallers, a director within the corporate banking team in Barclays, Northern Ireland. Kirk and Chris um, from KPMG have already touched on areas of focus for operational and financial resilience. And I know that that can sound like a few fancy words, but in the current times, it really is all about the strength uh, and leadership of management in our businesses taking proactive and effective action. A large part of our manufacturing base in Northern Ireland is made up of family businesses that have invested and have grown over a number of generations. And it is vital that these businesses are protected and their finances and operations are in the state that sees them through this period and ideally in a position of strength to take advantage of opportunities as we start to come out. Since mid-March, the UK Chancellor has announced a never expanding and ever changing package of measures to support businesses impacted. 
it's important that all businesses call on available sources of support. And what I wanted to do this morning was to touch on ways that your bank may be able to help you. In the main, the government schemes that are being delivered through the banks are debt products, and that is a point worth emphasizing. They will add liability to your balance sheet and will also absorb cash flow when the repayments do need to be made. So I would reiterate all the points that Chris has already made in looking at costs and other ways of preserving cash as a first port of call. There are also other ways that banks and lenders can support, with the most common being mid-term capital repayment holidays, whether that's on mortgages, um, term loans or asset finance agreements. At Barclays, at this stage now, most of our business loans over 25,000 now have had 12 month capital repayment holidays applied to them. So if you haven't already done so, um, consider exploring that as well. Unfortunately, um, or you may well say fortunately, we don't have time on this call to get into all the fine detail and terms and conditions of the various government schemes. But I, I just wanted to make some general high level comments on the various schemes. So first off, the coronavirus business interruption loan referred to as Siebel. It was launched on the 23rd of March and it's for businesses with group turnover under 45 million, offering lending up to 5 million on terms up to five years. Under it, the government will pay all interest and fees in the first year. Secondly, there is the coronavirus large business interruption loan scheme, um, or what we are calling syllable. It was launched on the 20th of April and is for businesses with group turnover greater than 45 million and offers lending of up to 50 million on terms of up to three years. Now, unlike the smaller scheme, the government doesn't cover interest and fees in the first year under that larger scheme. Under both of these schemes, you have to be able to demonstrate that your business is viable. I, before the pandemic, you were able to meet all your commitments as they fell due and you had reasonable liquidity. And also that your business is likely to be able to pay, repay the loan over its time frame. Now, one area that we have seen some businesses fall down on is scale up type companies where they have accumulated losses or, or, or carried forward losses greater than half of their share capital in their balance sheet as at December 19th. And unfortunately, that is tripping some up. And if that is the case, uh, that business will not be eligible under the scheme. And the more recently announced schemes, the Future Fund or the Bounce Back Loan may be more so. So just coming on to them, the Bounce Back Loan Scheme is due to launch this Monday, the 4th of May. It's aimed at smaller businesses and lets you apply for micro loans worth up to 25% of your business turnover up to a cap of 50,000. The scheme is designed to be simple and easy to use with online application and minimal information requirements. Similar to the Siebel scheme, loan terms are expected to be up to six years and the government have said that they will also cover interest and fees in the first year under that scheme. And it's expected that the cash uh, would be made available to successful applicants within days. The other one that we're waiting on future detail on is the future fund. It is more of an equity-based scheme as opposed to debt and is expected to be delivered in the form of convertible loans. No definitive launch date has been announced, but it is expected to open during May. As I say, details are still being fleshed out and to be confirmed at this stage. Um, but at this stage, we are told that it will be open to UK businesses who have previously raised 250,000 in equity investment in the last five years and it will provide match funding for new equity investment rounds. Loans under these schemes that I've referred to are mostly administered by accredited lenders, which are listed on the British Business Bank website. But at a local level, they include Danske, Ulster, Bank of Ireland, HSBC, Santander, ourselves at Barclays, and recently AIB has been added to the list of accredited lenders. If your existing bank is an accredited lender, they will be best placed to support you at speed. So I would suggest going to them as your first port of call. 
when you've established what scheme is most suitable to your business and pick down through the eligibility criteria, your thoughts will turn to what amount of borrowing you need to get through the period. Admittedly, that is a really tough question when the length of the period itself is undefined. Typically, you should be looking at your cash burn rate, which is the cash required to fund critical expenses, overheads, and ongoing creditor payments during a short to medium term period. For manufacturers, support for working capital is also likely to be required, such as continuity of stock uh, or payment of outstanding invoices. The two big areas that your lender will focus on is ensuring that your business is viable and the amount that you're borrowing is affordable. Similar to any lending request under normal conditions, your bank will ideally want to see historic financials, forecasts, and they will pay particular attention to an immediate cash flow forecast. Under recent announcements on Siebel's, accredited lenders can no longer insist on forecasts as a condition. And this was in recognition of the fact that many applicants, particularly at the smaller end of the scale, didn't have the resource or the capability to provide detailed forecasts, and this was acting as a blocker. However, where forecasts are provided, the lenders can take these into account. And my advice is that where possible, it is good business practice, as Chris has already touched on, to look at both short and medium term forecasts and it could be helpful to your bank if you shared them. Look, hopefully that has covered a lot of the theory. Um, in practice, these schemes have been stood up at pace over the course of the last five to six weeks at a time when banks themselves have been dealing with disruption to their own operations with a move from office working to home working. Take that along with a huge volume of applications, it was inevitable that there would be some initial teething problems with the schemes and those have attracted plenty of media attention. However, what I wanted to do on this call was to assure you that applications are being approved and monies are being drawn. And I thought it might be useful if I touched on two local manufacturing businesses that we have recently supported through Siebel's. The first, um, is a company around noon, maybe known to some on the call. They're a fast-growing, award-winning business. Uh, they have production facilities both here in Newry and across the water in Slough. They manufacture sandwiches, salads, and food-to-go products for sectors including travel, hospitality, convenience, and coffee chains. This year, they were targeting a sales turnover of about 30 million. However, in the space of two weeks, due to the impact of coronavirus, sales dropped dramatically. Having just won a number of new contracts worth several million, which are now on hold, they've had to furlough a significant number of staff and reduce production days. They wanted, however, to make sure that they continued to pay their suppliers and staff during the period of this epidemic. Management engaged with us at an early stage and we worked closely with them to understand the situation and how we could help the business. Our credit risk team were supportive and prompt, meaning that the loan was sanctioned less than two days after the scheme opened. Siebel has given around noon significant breathing space and management there has been appreciative of the support and the speed of delivery. And they believe that the loan will help them stay in the game and hopefully come back stronger. Another local manufacturing business we supported recently was Nugent Group, again known to some on the call. A Mid-Ulster-based manufacturer of trailers, agri-machinery and livestock equipment. And over the last four years, the group has almost doubled turnover after some really good product development, getting into new export markets and increasing their capacity from some significant investment in facilities and equipment. So like many other businesses pre-COVID, they were going into 2020 with some good momentum. As has been the case with many manufacturers, COVID meant some real supply chain challenges. And Kirk has touched on those, um, both in terms of getting materials in and getting exports out. In addition, the health and welfare of factory floor workers was a challenge. Nugent therefore decided early on to stop production for a period of time and took advantage of the job retention scheme. However, given that the majority of staff were on weekly payroll and the job retention scheme at that time was not expected to pay out until late April, early May, Nugent sought funding support to ensure that they were able to pay staff on their normal weekly payroll cycle and also make all their critical payments during the period of closure. 
So we work together reviewing cash flows and assessing future affordability and through a combination of increased working capital facilities, repayment holidays on existing borrowings and a coronavirus business interruption loan, we were able to provide financial breathing space to help them support their employees and ensure that the business is well placed to take advantage of opportunities when the market starts to recover. Look, this is coming towards the end of my slot, uh, and I'm very conscious that I've thrown a lot of information at you. But two key takeaways that I want to leave you with are, firstly, there is huge uncertainty as to how the next six to 12 months will pan out for everyone, including manufacturers. You could spend a lifetime debating the assumptions and your forecasts. My encouragement to you would be to draw a line make your assumptions based on your best estimates, set out your forecasts, and try to ensure that you have the financial cushion in place to see your business through. Secondly, my other takeaway is that despite some adverse media, the government support schemes are up and running and significant monies are flowing to local businesses under those schemes. If you're thinking of imply, applying, I would encourage you to engage with your that? bank as early as possible. And close the inside one. Um, I hope this has been helpful. And if there are any questions at the end, I would be happy to answer where I can. I'll now pack to Stephen um, for the Q&A with Seamus. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Kirk and John, thanks for that so far. Uh, Seamus Keig uh, has joined us. Seamus, if you can turn your microphone on there as well for us. That would be great. Uh, Seamus, your microphone's still off there. That's okay, you now, now. Yeah, it's you now, yeah. Seamus, I know you're in, uh, in England at the moment, uh, visiting your colleagues and, and sites around the country. Uh, so thanks for taking time to join us. Can we just ask how uh, Cray are weathering the current storm? Uh, so thanks, Stephen. Cray are weathering the storm. Um, four weeks in, a whole lot better than I hadn't uh, feared. Uh, end of March, beginning of April, um, just like everybody else. When It happened so fast. It really happened so fast that we were in the crest of a wave going into March and through the, up into the middle of March, and then around the middle of March, it just went pear-shaped. And, and uh, we had to rapidly downsize and all, all the things we, the Bill of Speakers have been talking about in terms of furlough and staff. But, what we didn't do is we didn't close. I and mean, there's a lot of advice going around at that time if you um, should close your business. We didn't close our business. Um, we were seen as critical. Construction was seen as critical. And um, so four weeks on, I'm out and around this. This week, and it's been very encouraging. So I, this month of April is over. We've... Um, our turnover, our sales invoice sales are back up at 40%, but they're not completely collapsed. We've had a reasonably good order book come in in April. Our cash has kept well up. We've paid most of our suppliers, um, and we're in a good place going into to May. So that's the story of the year. Great, Seamus. Uh, in terms of kind of facing that crisis and that, that those waves coming towards you, uh, what were the kind of top three things that you as a business leader did and that you would encourage other business leaders to do? We have, well, the way I, uh, I looked at this, Stephen, and is that we have been through a couple of crises in our short history, uh, our recent history. So in 2008, we had a crisis with the whole downturn of the, the financial crash, and, and then our construction industry was decimated. Like our market at that time contracted by 50-60% literally within a very short period of time. So we had radical things to do at that time. We had to lay off 300 people and we were really just hanging on in there. And um, we regrouped and kept focus on what business we could win. Then we came through a difficult stage in 2014 where we were trying to grow the business mainly in GB and uh, taking on new jobs and just maybe too competitive in them, difficult market. and weren't trading profit, but we came through it again, and we're fit to establish that market. So coming into this recession here, while I'm not saying we were in a great position, the experience we had from dealing with those other ones 
put me in it personally in a uh, mentally a much stronger position to deal with. So obviously very nervous about the whole health situation, the health of our people. Our people were, you know, unlike the other two times, they were very nervous. There was family relations. People wanted to go home. They were wanted to self isolate. They had family, uh, mothers, parents, uh, on it, people at home. So there was a whole crisis. So there was a lot of pressure on us then to you know so to let people take time off. So that meant that we furloughed about four hundred people, and um, and that furlough system was very good. It's very, 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 very good for us. Uh, we followed and very good for the employees, and they gave us all a bit of space, a bit of space to plan our way through this. Um, um, so the top thing things for us was keeping our nerve, just not panicking, just keeping my nerve, knowing it's not the end of the world. It will come through this. The fact that we couldn't see it as nobody else can see it, it's gone on longer than now than anybody could have forecast that. So we're, we're, everybody was expecting us to run for nine months to a year in some form. Um, always stayed very focused on our customers and their supply. And decisions that we made um, many years ago, when we go back 20 years ago, bit by bit, was to change our business model from being just purely a manufacturer to be a much more holistic provider in terms. So we would see ourselves as a specialist precast construction company. We take on the design, the manufacturing, and assembly. And that has given us a wider appeal. Um, 85% of our business is in GB. So it was important to keep connected with that GB clientele. Um, and most of, uh, of our turnover of that 5 million uh, plus turnover in, in April has come from, from England, um, mainly from larger contracts. Also, uh, in a crisis situation, people want to see the leaders of the business. So you have to show yourself around and people are asking questions. And it's not that you have to have all the answers, but you have to know, you have to be seen there. And you have to just rationalize that where the business was, where we're still hoping to go. We don't know all the answers, but we feel that there's nothing, we're not going to go backwards. In other words, like, I mean, we're in an era where we're, um, we're going to be more electric cars. We feel that in our industry, we're going to be lots more prefabrication, off-site construction. We feel that we made, we're well established in that. And we feel that that is going to be more of a trend, so we feel more of a market for us. We have experience in that. Uh, I'm sitting on a site office here in Chatham near Gillingham, and uh, we're building 200 pre apartments, pre-cast apartments um, they're on, on site, and we're, we're contracted to be off around the end of June. We want to slip a bit down in July, but we think we can recover the program. So I've gone around lots of our, our, our sites. It's going around. People that has gone down very well. It's gone very well with the clients. Very regular conversation here about our story as we are about their story. People are, what are you doing? How are you all doing it? Um, it's kept, uh, it's given them confidence in us that we're here, we're going to be here for long term. Um, and it's given me confidence that there's a, there's a world beyond COVID and hopefully Crea will be in that world too. Um, um, there might have been queries that we're still hoping for, it's still very strong. Um, so, uh, what would I say, you know, I was just thinking about different things, you know. Um, whenever you go through a crisis and there's a lot of people all the costs out. Yes, of course, and it's a great time to reorganize your business, and we have done that. But don't get that lean that you can't reestablish yourself again. Don't get that lean that you can't go out and find your business. Don't get that lean because just getting lean isn't good enough. You have to find a way forward. You have to bring revenue into the business. You have to see a new opportunity, and they're there. They're still there. The fact that you may not see them doesn't mean they're not there. There will be a world, and it's how you get your main condition. And, and also, uh, talking to our people about that there, talking to, to, to our people and, 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 spread, uh, and discussing that with them, discussing it with clients, 
makes it a much more happy place for the people to work. They see that there is hope here. It's not the end of the world. Uh, in fact, I would say that coming to work is the most enjoyable part of most people's lives at the moment at Grey Account because the morale is so good. Um, and uh, I know there's a lot of, maybe about 50 people working from home at the moment. That's because of personal circumstances. I mean, respect that, but they're well connected with Team and Zoom and all these other things. So we're well connected and um, there's good communication. So, you know, I don't want to sound that it's great, but um, I'm reasonably positive about of, 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 of the whole thing. Um, we have restructured the business in those four weeks. We went from five divisions to three divisions. We feel that we have made decisions of the business that would be harder to make in better times because some parts, they weren't doing that well, but they weren't doing that bad. You would reclose them or restructure them. But this gave us a chance to just to, to, uh, very quickly to reassess where we are. And that was a, an evolution over those four weeks we've done. And we're almost there. We're almost there. So we feel we will take a lot of costs out of the company, a lot of costs out of the company. We'll be a leaner company, a fitter company, uh, a better company. And um, I don't want to say too much more because you may think it's, it's it, there's no problems. There is. The, the issues that, that we mainly had were, were uh, in around people, getting people comfortable. Um, like families were putting their husbands and uh, partners under pressure that they shouldn't be at work and not to come to work and work was not a good place for them to be. And they'd also, maybe they'd also just commitments at home for whatever reason. And also just learning to work around that um, not put anybody under pressure. People don't want to come over. They want to, uh, they want to work from. We have been very accommodating. That. And it's also like when you go into an office and we built a new office, we did, and we have a big opening at it. And my goodness, for the month of April, there was just nobody in it. And I said, oh my God, what did we spend all this bloody money for? But we did. But, you know, it's there. And I know, was, and I was thinking back in 2007, we just built a new factory up in our a big factory, spent a lot of money on it. And I thought, oh my goodness, I wish we had never spent this money. But that factory has been such a godsend to us since 2010, right through. And it's, in fact, it's very busy at the moment, flat out. And we, you know, so things that were good in decisions will still be good decisions. It's not the end of the world. It will come again. There are green shoots all the time coming out of this. There will be new opportunities for things. It's, and you have to work hard. At it. You can't expect to sit at home and put the phone on the answer machine and it'll all happen before you come back and it'll turn out. Oh, you have to be out there looking for it. You have to keep connected. You have to be you have to be positive and, and keep your mind in that 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 phase and be resilient. And when you when we go home in the evening, you know, and you know, be asking me, well, how to go the day? And you know, you go on the news. There's six hundred dead a the day. There's seven hundred. You know, these are scary times. These are people are scared. And you know, in their own parish, you know, they come in with the same as everybody's parish. There's no. Mass, there's no church, there's a funeral last Saturday, you know, just stand on outside and just family goes to the grave. Really eerie situations that just never could have dreamed that that would happen in, in these times. And yet we're coping with it well. And that, but I feel it's a time for leaders to show positivity, a can do spirit, a resilient spirit. But not just to live in that alone, to do something about it. And every company needs, every business needs business. It needs to have customers. It needs to be able to, to differentiate itself. That means that the business has to take on maybe new skills. And like things that, you know, in the years that we've always we've taken on is new IT skills, new design skills, uh, taking on risk. So we're here building apartments in Gillingham and I think, my goodness, what are we doing that for? But when you come here, it's gone very well. And the people on this site have been really reasonably happy. They think we should be a wee bit further, but they respect the effort we put in. But they respect the fact that our people are here doing it. They respect that our people are here doing it and doing it well. And, uh, you know, people are the same all over the world. You know, once you get out and meet them, they're, they're, you know, you build up those uh, friendships and relationships, and people are generally all there to help each other. So... My, it's, 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 don't give up, get out there, stay at it, be positive, uh, find a way, uh, be interested in how other people are doing, um, be interested in how your own people do. And you know, the ideas don't all come from the top, they come from all within the company and we get, you know, good things. I just can't overstate how important that is. And also your whole strategy of lean, 
good quality, good safety, respect all the COVID requirements of social distancing and hygiene and group, uh, you know, no group meetings and um, working from home wherever possible. Also, but your vision for the business, you know, how many times I have what our vision is for the business, where we see our future at, how we're going to be, how we organize ourselves to be in that. Um, uh, there's a young team, and you know I'd be very mindful that there's a new generation, you know, and the business is maybe two or three since I'm in it, but that this is their future. So I feel a big responsibility that we hand on something very positive, and that we, you know, I've had to deal with lots of setbacks in my life. Thankfully, only business setbacks, but nothing worse. Setbacks that we recover. This is a setback. It's not the end of the world. Seamus, thanks very much for that. Uh, that's a very positive. Uh, in the midst of what's a lot of doom and gloom, it's a very positive outlook and a very real one as well. You've had to take very difficult decisions. You've had to uh, make sure that uh, the new environment that we're in is being adapted uh, to within your own business. Uh, and I, I can I just say as somebody who's been stuck at home for the last six weeks, I have a lot of fat on me now. They see me through the winter. So they... they the concept of not being too lean that you can't respond to uh, what goes on, I think is very wise to say the least, that positivity, but the visibility as well, uh, I think is really important. We have some questions that have come in and I want to make sure we get to, to some of those. So if all the panelists could uh, switch the cameras and mics back on, it would be great. The first one that's come in was from uh, Mark Huddleston and he was talking about uh, developing that local stronger supply chain. We've been uh, engaged with government, with CPD, with the NHS and all there, that uh, that minus three, minus five type approach of trying to source supplies from everywhere in the world and that money was the, the only thing that mattered. Well, there's definitely a change of attitude there. That supply chain resilience, getting uh, the supply when it's called upon, uh, by the buyer is, is now just as important as the price. And I think uh, certainly any new strategy from the department, from Invest NI and others will reflect that. And I'm sure that will be the same in terms of the private sector buyer as well. The, it's probably one for John, I would assume. Uh, the undertaking in distress rules did apply to the bounce back loans in the original announcement that was made uh, earlier this week. Has this been, or is it in the process of being changed, John? Yeah, Chris, look, thanks for the question. Um, that, that was in the original announcement for the um, bounce back loan. It's still in there um, and the scheme is due to go live on, on Monday. So potentially that also rules out those with the accumulated losses, leaving them just into the future fund scheme. Um, the, the only thing that I would say is that uh, the schemes ha have been announced at pace and have changed at pace. And even if you look back to the original Sable scheme, um, I I'm going to lose track of my dates, but it, it, it was launched sometime sort of 20th of March, and then there was a major revision to it a week later. So um, the, the challenge with that is that the undertaking, uh, the, the business in distress undertaking, is related into state aid. Um, legislation, which is European legislation, so it's a difficult one for the government and the British Business Bank to get around and, and remove. So I, I don't know um, whether it's still in there. As I say, the final terms w will only come out on Monday whenever the scheme's launched, so we can only really wait and hope and wait and see, Chris. Hi, uh, Kurt, maybe this is one for yourself and I'll come back to the banking uh, piece. Given the global supply chain disruption, uh, does reliance on just-in-time approach to inventory management carry just too much risk right now? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't have to. Yes, typically if you move to just-in-time supply agreement, that will significantly reduce the amount of inventory you've got to hold. But I think what's critical here is, a, you know, as I mentioned uh, when I talked through some of the actions, it's about getting below tier one. You know, it's about understanding what's going on with that just in time, um, uh, just in time supplier. What uh, do they have in place with their 
You can do that with the lens of how can you also uh, reduce carbon emissions at the same time. Um, so just a future, you know, like future, uh, future proof vision around any changes you might be looking to make. Chris, I'll maybe pass one uh, on to you there in terms of uh, what are the key financial resilience measures? To yeah, I think, Stephen, as I mentioned um, during the discussion and John touched on, and accepting that this is not easy, you know, given the current uncertainty but actually you know trying to forecast what the business is going to look like on a grab building looking at the scenarios and then given this careful consideration in terms of potential funding requirement COVID, also recognizing that there might be you know the potential for a second wave of this and there might be further you know some further disruption to enable you then to, to, to look at your current facilities and determine what the funding requirement might be if that can be so it's addressed within your current facilities, then great. But if not, then you know early engagement with funders. If you can see there's going to be a requirement down the line, is certainly something I think would be would be important. Seamus, so maybe I uh, pass this one to yourself. But it's a it's a question we're getting from manufacturers over the last couple of weeks as people prepare to come back to work. So you you've had some staff put off on furlough, and you're probably now you're, you're considering bringing some of those staff back into the business. I. Uh, what what are the kind of key things do you think that is required to get morale back there, but particularly to motivate people to come back to work when they could be at home on eighty percent of their money? Well, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, we we just needed more production in our tin factory, and we needed people to come back. And particularly in trades, we needed our carpenters and our joiners to come back, and there was sort of the reluctance of a lot of them to come back. So we made up our list. And to be honest, we got on the phone, and I got on the phone myself, and I rang them around, and we, and we had a bit of a, a good conversation about where I saw it, where they saw it. They weren't long conversations, but just to, the most important thing is that there's a future here. I, I just told them exactly as much as what I told you already, and we need them back, and they're very crucial to us. And look, guys, we're all to survive this. We all need to stick in here together. We need you back here. We need everybody pumping at the wheel. If ever we need to be a team, we need to be a team now. And... Uh, that type of motivational encouragement, just genuine conversation. And, and there was obviously a two way conversation, but most of them were really glad to hear from us. Most of them were like getting conversation. And I told them not to, you know, don't get caught up and just don't watch too much news. Don't watch too much of this stuff, okay? Because you can only deal, and I can only deal with what's in front of me. I can't change the world. I can't do any of these things. I can only do. So my job is, is that. And, and we need it to be a team. We need to deliver the jobs we have and do them well. We need to get the money in. We need to get paid. We need to get cash in to keep paying suppliers. With it. And we need to keep one in business. And that's a, that's a cycle there. And also, you know, uh, and just for your mental well being, it's a good place to be. You need to be back in contact with people again. You need to be, you know, they, they miss the camaraderie of working with a colleague. So, nothing like communication, nothing like connecting with people. There's nothing to beat it, like whatever you do, you know, and you can send so many letters, so many emails, still a good old phone call, sorry to beat. 